All right. Well, welcome to Birding 101. Um, today I'm going to help you learn some techniques and I'm um, going to talk about field guides and all kinds of stuff. So the official title of this is Birding 101, but really it's like adventures in birding. Um, even you can have all kinds of different days. You can have good days, you can have mundane days, less than desirable days, but they're still good days. Um, especially when you start interacting with other birders, um, taking in scenery, beautiful scenery around you and seeing that rare or uncommon bird or even just a common bird is good. When I go birding by myself, you know, you're kind of quiet and still, I've had all kinds of interactions with birds. Um, I've witnessed some pretty cool things. Birding has taken me all over the United States. I've gone up to Barrow, Alaska, all the way down to Brownsville, Texas. And this is all just, you know, the world of birding. <laughs> so there are all kinds of birds that come in through Litzinger. And depending on the time of year I'm there, these are the birds that I rely will reliably see every year. So there's a lot of birds. Okay, so there's a lot to consider when looking at a bird and at first it's overwhelming, but once you get the hang of what to look for on a bird, it's like an open book test because you're going to have a field guide with you and that field guide is going to help you look at the habitat and location of the bird you're looking at, the time of year, um, sometimes the books will even describe behavior of a bird, and of course the variety and plumage. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you're not gonna feel overwhelmed and to look at a bird like this. And you're actually gonna, you know, you're gonna see, you know, the house sparrow versus the crazy bird that, you, that is there right there. The first thing that's pretty important though is getting familiar with the terminology. The field guides will have that in the beginning of the book. Um, they're all pretty simple. And so, you know, these are, especially with the head, there's, there's a lot to look at on the head, but you know, other things too. So here are the ID basics. When you look at a bird, these are the things you wanna to think about. The overall shape and size of the bird. And then you're gonna focus on the, the head. You're gonna basically do a head to toe assessment. And you're gonna look at the head and the beak see if there's any different characteristics on the wings, the tail, sometimes even the feet. And when I look at a bird, the these are the questions I, I ask myself. How is it chunky? Is it streamlined? Is it big like a hawk? Is it small like a chickadee? Um, things like that. So when you look at these two bird silhouettes, what would you describe them as? Anybody? Blender. Or the Cardinal card? size. Okay. Chunky. Yeah. Look at the robin over there. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if you guessed robin and cardinal. Um, also, like, so when I, when people come to me with identifications, I'll ask them, how big is this? Big like a robin, chunky like a robin. That kind of that kind of thing. So those are things you can ask yourself. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at is the head. Um, does the bird have a crest or does it have a crown? And is what color is the crown? And then the eyes. Is there a stripe in the through the eye, above the eye? Does it have an eye ring or none of the above? And then birds have all different uh, shapes and sizes of beaks um, suited to their needs. Um, so you can have thick conical beaks like on a cardinal to crack those shells. It can have a curved beak like a raptor that's meant for piercing and piercing and tearing flesh. You can have a woodpecker beak where it's long and narrow, but it's sturdy for penetrating tree bark. And then you can have those beaks like warblers and vireos where it's kind of small and suited for catching insects. And of course the tail is also an important thing. Um, it can actually help you differentiate between two bird species, depending on what the tail looks like. And I'm going to give you an example of that. 
Um, so savanna sparrows and song sparrows are often confused. Um, savanna sparrows are known for having a yellow above their eye and song sparrow doesn't. But a song sparrow is also known for having a, a, a spot on the center of its breast, but you may not always see that spot on the breast. And with the savanna sparrow, that yellow can vary. It can have a lot of yellow or just a tiny bit of yellow. But for me, I look at the tail. I mean, if you can see the difference in the tail, it's a notched tail on the savanna sparrow. And then they don't, the song sparrow doesn't have a notch in their tail. And so this is, I guess, why it's important to look at more than one field mark on a bird. A lot of people also get hairy woodpeckers and downy woodpeckers mixed up. Um, so the one thing you can look at is the overall size. A hairy woodpecker will be larger and have a longer beak, whereas the downy will have is smaller with a shorter beak. But what if you've never seen a hairy woodpecker before? Or what if this woodpecker is far away? Because that's another thing you need to keep in mind is distance. Distance will play tricks on your size perception. So another thing to look at is their tails. The tails have on a, on a downy woodpecker has spots and a hairy does not have any spots, it's just white. And if you can see that. And habitat and location is another consideration um, because um, a lot of people will mistake one bird for another if they don't look at a field guide or just kind of think through the process. So for example, you're not gonna find a meadow lark in the woods because it's a prairie bird, just like you're not gonna find a meadow lark in Alaska because you don't find meadow larks in Alaska. So you always wanna kind of ask yourself a bunch of questions. So if you see a bird and you're like, yeah, I'm not sure that's a meadow lark, it probably isn't, especially if it's in the wrong habitat. And behavior. Some, some of the field guides will talk about behavior. Um, I wish I had more examples, but I do have a few. Like for example, say you're on the highway, you're zipping down and you see this bird hovering in the air in the grassy area next to the highway, but you don't really get a good look at any field marks. Well, kestrels are known for hovering mid-flight before they strike their prey. issues here. And so uh, white-throated sparrows, white-crowned sparrows, dark-eyed juncos, a lot of the feed um, ground feeders are known for scratching. Other examples, um, I wish I, I wish I had a video of an Eastern Phoebe Phoebe is a flycatcher and they look like all other flycatchers. But if you see a Phoebe, its tail will be bobbing as it perches, and then you know it's a Phoebe. Okay, this is where we're going to talk about plumage. For me, this is the nitty gritty of the bird identification. This is where you do your head to tail assessments of the birds you're looking at, because um, a lot of times, a lot of songbirds will have sexual dimorphism. And generally speaking, this isn't always the case, but a male will be brighter and flashier and the female is usually more muted colors, more suited for camouflage. And American goldfinch is a good example. Um, with our head to toe assessment here, if you look that the, the males have the black cap and they have all yellow dark feathers and the females are kind of just not as yellow, they don't have a cap, but then during the winter time you have, they have a different plumage. And so they look like this. But again, if you look, the, the wings are the same and they do have yellow heads. American kestrels are the same way. Males have blue, females don't. But if you look, they've got that curved beak. So that tells you it's a raptor. Brown-headed cowbirds. Males on the left, all black, brown head, 
females on the right. And also I forgot to add the juveniles. There's a lot of juvenile species that look like the adults, adult females. And usually what I do is I look at that beak and if you know, they, these are both the same. Baltimore Orioles, males here on the left, bright, bright orange, very black, uh, females not quite as orange, but again, look at the beak, they look the same. So that's how you know it's a Baltimore Oriole. House finch, I'm sure everyone has familiar with house finches. You have the female on the left, males on the right. Indigo bunting, this is one that sometimes can be tricky. I mean, because look how different the male is from the female. Very bright, vivid blue. The female's brown and also the, the juveniles are brown. But again, look at the beak. So the beak here, the top is, th is this dark gray and the bottom is kind of a silver color. House sparrows very, look very different. Males on the left, females on the right. Red winged blackbirds are another one that are tricky. Um, male here is on the left, females on the right, and the juveniles will look like the females. Well, they'll just be kind of brown and stripy. Uh, rose breasted grosbeak. Males on the left, females on the right. Again, look at the beak. They got that beak for cracking hard shells. And I am going to tell you a funny story. So a good friend of mine um, worked at World, who works at World Bird Sanctuary got me into birding. Um, we would go out either before or after our, our shifts. And then we ended up going out um, on trails and things. And when I was first learning how to bird, she would make me tell her the name of the bird. So I would, you know, it would ingrain in my memory. Well, we were looking at a male rose-breasted grosbeak and I said, this is a grosbeak, but I cannot think of the name of the first part of the name. And she's like, well, it's named after a flower. And I said, tulip-breasted grosbeak, because all I could think of was red tulips. And so this is like, this experience really helped me um, remember the name of this bird. And that's another thing you can do when you're trying to remember bird names is, you know, story like that, or maybe it reminds you, the color reminds you of something or a place you were when you first saw it. All these things help, help you remember the different birds you're learning. And young birds, young birds also look very different from their parents. Again, with that head to toe assessment, we got to look from the top to the bottom. Um, robins, to me, look very different from their parents, although you can still kind of tell that they're American robins, especially with their, their chunky size. But um, a, a thing I want to point out too is a lot of times when they first fledge, they look, their feathers look different than from when they are later in the summer. Like this bird on the left, I'm sorry, on the right, I took this picture like in May. And then I took this picture on the left, like August or September, I think. Okay, so bald eagles, I tend to think of them as high school students just because it takes them four years to get to reach sexual maturity and to reach that plumage that we all know. Um, so like their freshman year, the first year they hatch, they're all brown. And then their sophomore year, they're kind of a mottled brown and white, but even the differences between two birds of the same age can be quite striking as you can see here. And then the third year, for whatever reason, they are, their chests are all white. And then you have your adult, the fourth year. Um, if you notice, this guy still has a little bit of, of brown in, in his white head. By the fifth year, they should be completely white and they have a very bright yellow beak. And that's the other thing I forgot to point out is the beaks. If you notice, um, their beaks are all brown. And our Eastern Bluebird friends. And starlings have all kinds of things going on with their plumage. Uh, adults are different 
in the spring and summer versus the fall and winter. And even the juveniles look pretty different. So this picture, my father-in-law took this picture several years ago. And it's obvious that the, this is an adult feeding a juvenile. But if you look at how different it looks in the winter time here in, the, in this middle picture, I mean, they just, I think that's, they deserve the name Starling just because of all the feathers, they look like stars. Um, and then here, the juvenile is very brown looking. And then I don't know when, what time of year this picture was taken, but I'm guessing winter, just because if you can see it's winter plumage there in the belly. But again, look at the beak, look how long their beaks are. red tail hawks. I will tell you, I've been birding a long time and I still get juvenile red tail hawks and um, juvenile red shouldered hawks mixed up. I wish I had pictures of red shouldered hawks, but I don't. Anyway, um, you can see the feathers and the juvenile, the tail feathers look very different. Um, they're kind of brown with stripes. And then by, oh, I guess their third, second or third year, they'll get that brick red tail that we all know. Okay, so the anatomy of a field guide. Once you get your, your bird birding basics down, um, field guides are really going to help you. This is where the open book test kind of comes in handy, or is what I'm talking about. Um, so the front of the book, all field guides will have um, like a color color codes. So, but they may be different colors, but I think they're pretty much all the same. But like you have your breeding. So this is where the, you'll find the birds in the spring you know, spring and summer. For this one, purple is when they're there year round. Um, blue is winter. In the bird descriptions. So the, a lot of times um, the, these will d discuss what the bird looks like, um, juvenile plumage, any habits it may have. So for example, let's say I'm looking at a bird that I think it is American tree sparrow, but I'm not 100% sure. Well, here's where I do my head to toe. So I'm gonna look at the top and I'm like, okay, well, this bird has kind of a ru rusty cap and the field sparrow, not so much. And the beak, I know this is kind of, it's not easy to look at this because I, I wish I could have enlarged it more than I did. But, but if you can see it, uh, the American tree sparrow has a bicolored bill and a field sparrow has a very pink bill. Uh, American tree sparrow has that spot and the uh, field sparrow does not. So then I'm gonna look over here at the side and look at where this bird is. So field sparrow and the American tree sparrow are both in Missouri. The American tree sparrow is here only during the winter time and a field sparrow is here all year round. Another thing I want to add is a lot of times too, I'm going to look at other birds in the book to, to rule out, to further rule out American tree sparrow, field sparrow. And I know I'm not going to see a rufous wing sparrow or a rufous crown sparrow because they're nowhere near Missouri. And I will add that that's, um, it can be a, a common mistake for new birders is they think they're seeing a bird that's not normally in the area. So just be careful when you start looking at birds and identifying them. If the bird isn't in St. Louis, in Missouri, there's good chances that it's not the bird you think it is. All right, quiz time. I hope you can see the pictures all right. So I took this picture at Shaw Nature Reserve this spring, I'm sorry, this summer, I think it was in June. So I'm going to give you a minute and I'm going to let you look at the book and look at the picture and tell me what you think it is. And feel free to comment if you have questions. And just so everybody knows, all you have to do to temporarily unmute yourself is to press the space bar and hold it down while you're talking. On your uh, on your laptop or computer. Dan thinks it's a house wren. He would be correct. It is a house wren, and another clue is their cavity nesters, 
and they'll so they'll use nest boxes in Carolina Wren's you know, there's always exceptions to the rule, but generally speaking, they are not uh, cavity, um, cavity nesters. And winter wrens are only here during the winter time. Can you talk everybody through how you would assess that to be a house wren using yes. the guide? Okay. Um, so I'm looking at this wren and I look at the beak. So the beak and the tail tell me it's a wren. Um, wrens tend to have uh, the way they hold themselves um, they kind of hold up their be their uh, their tail. Now you can't see me doing this, but also I'm going to look. I don't see an eye stripe like a Carolina wren would have. Um, it's kind of sort of an eye ring, but it's subtle. I mean, it, the book here is makes it look like it has more of an eye ring than it does. But then I'm going to also look at my my uh, range map. So this tells me that the house wren is found in Missouri during the summer. Uh, winter wren, I know you can't really see it, but uh, winter wrens are here during the winter only. And if you look at the Carolina wren, that eye stripe is very, very prominent. And they are bigger than a house wren. And beewicks wren, um, I don't have a lot of experience with beewicks wrens. Other than that, them being in St. Louis is very uncommon. Okay, next bird. I took this picture at Columbia Bottom Conservation Area in February one year. So be sure to look at the head, the beak, uh, notice if there's any other characteristics that stand out to you. Is that a golden um, golden crown sparrow? Well, I took it. I, I took it in St. Louis. If you notice, I don't, I don't have a map, so. Oh, the golden crown sparrow. If you can see here on the field guide, they're up in Alaska, and Canada. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> what about a white crown sparrow? Yes, it is a juvenile white crown sparrow, and. Yeah, head to toe. So if you can see that the the um, the adult does have the white and brown, but look at the beak. The beak is pink, like it is in the adult. And the field guide does show you the brown, kind of the brown top that it has. Okay, now look at the look at that brown stripe down the center of the head. Yes. And the only one that has a brown stripe. And I understand what you said about finding fine in Alaska, but all the other uh, white crown sparrows have white and this is brown. But the juveniles have the brown. I don't know if you can see the picture on oh, that. Okay, no. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, show yeah. it very well. Um, yeah, but that's, this is where, you know, if, if you first start birding and you see this and you think it's a golden crown sparrow, that's when you want to pause and think, wait a minute, that bird's really not found in Missouri. And then that's when you go to the field guide and kind of look at other things. So, um, you, so you, you, you get your, you do your first identification there and then you can go to the field guide to confirm one of the characteristics. Exactly. That's exactly right. That's, that's what I do too. I mean, it's like, I'll, you know, do my head to toe assessment of the bird, just kind of observe things about it. And then I'll go to the field guide and say, hmm, let me, let me look at the range that this bird is in. And then like white throated sparrows, I don't know if you remember in the video I showed you, they have kind of like a little bit of yellow right above the eye. And I guess you can't really see it as much in the juveniles, but. Okay, so there's all kinds of things out there. Um, there's extras. So of course you're gonna need binoculars and field guides, those are musts. But there's apps, magazines, organizations, and lift serves that will help you fine tune your techniques, your skill. Um, so we're gonna talk about all of these. And well, I will say, I don't mention lift serves anywhere else. So I'll talk about lift serves here for a second. 
listservs are helpful in that um, people will make announcements if they're running a bird walk or they're having a presentation on birding or, or something along those lines. Um, rare bird sightings will go on listservs. If you have questions, you need advice, that's the place you go and type it in because someone's going to help you. When I go on vacation or I go on a bird trip, I will get I will um, get online to their that state's listserv to see where if there's any rare bird sightings, and then I'll ask, hey, where's a good place for me to bird? I'm from out of town. So binoculars, this is like you got to really like your binoculars because this is what's going to help you identify a bird. Um, so the first two numbers. Um, so you had your eight by 42 and say your 10 by 42. So this is going to tell you the bigger the difference between the numbers, the brighter and sharper the image of the bird will show up. Um, so the eight and the 10, that's the, the magnification of the bird that you're going to be looking at. 42 is the diameter of the objective lens. And there's things to consider with that because you might think, well, gee, I want something bigger than 42. But when you get something bigger than a 42 millimeter objective lens, the binoculars are gonna turn, turn out to be heavy and hard to handle. And then if you get anything um, less than 42, like say you find a pair of binoculars that are like 30 millimeters, well, sure that the binoculars are gonna be a lot lighter in your hand, but that's gonna cut down on your light so if you're looking at a bird in poor lighting conditions, you're not going to be able to see a lot of the detail. And then with 8 and 10, again, you're going to be thinking, well, maybe I want something bigger than 10 millimeters. Well, so that way that when you get larger than 10, you're going to start picking up on handshake and heat shimmer. And also that's going to cut down on your field of view and believe it or not, the lighting. So anytime you have something smaller, like a seven, by, seven or eight is ideal because then you're gonna have a good field of view and good lighting. Another thing to take into consideration when you're looking at binoculars is how does it feel in your hand? How about that focus knob? Does that turn the way you like it? And of course the eyes, the eye pieces. I mean, that thing's gonna be up against your face. And you're, you're gonna make sure that you, you're comfortable with handling that. In your field guide, there's all kinds of field guides. Um, some field guides cover all of North America. And then there's um, field guides that just cover regions like um, birds that are west of the Rockies or east of the Rockies. Then you have field guides that have pictures of birds and other field guides that have illustrations. When I first started bird watching, birding, sorry, you don't say bird watching. Um, I picked one that was in the region of like east of the Rockies because I wanted to get familiar with the birds that, that were near home. And I didn't want to make, start making mistakes of thinking I was seeing something out west in my backyard. And apps are kind of a cool, very handy thing to have. There's apps that you pay for. There's apps that free are free. Um, Audubon has all kinds of apps depending on your interests. They have apps on hummingbirds, they have apps on owls, backyard birds. Um, a really good one that is free is Merlin. Um, that is by Cornell and it is kind of like a dichotomous key. So based on what you, what answers you give, the questions they provide, they will give you one or more birds to choose from. I have iBird Pro. Um, it's better for more experienced birds because iBird Pro and then Sibley has one, you have to type in the bird you want to look at. And there's all kinds of magazines, uh, Birds and Blooms, Bird Watching, Bird Watchers Digest. Cornell has one called Bird, bird Life. And there's a, another one called Birding by the American Birding Association. Birds and Blooms is more just of pictures, it has a lot of gardening things in it, but bird watching and bird watchers digest have um, just different tips and techniques to make you a better birder. And they'll also have one or two species they, they write about in each issue. And then we're gonna talk about the unofficial bird terms and activities. There's things you just kind of unspoken rules, I guess, if you will. So I kind of 
slipped up and said bird watching, it's birding, it's a verb. I went birding today, or have you gone birding lately? That kind of thing. And you don't say Canadian gee, goose, you say Canada goose. Uh, same with gull, it's gull, not seagull. And lifer, people will talk about how many lifers they have. And that's the first, the first time you see a particular bird species. And list, people keep all kinds of lists. Life list, daily list, state list, um, you name it. I keep, like personally, I keep a lifer list. And then I also keep a list of, um, I call it my vacation list of birds I see while I'm on trips. And then your interactions with birders, you're, you're gonna meet some of the nicest, most generous people. Um, a lot of times, like say, if you go out to a lake or uh, like Riverlands, someone will have a scope and they, and, and they share it. Say, hey, you wanna look at this bird through my scope? Of course, with COVID, you know, I don't think that's really a thing right now, but it may change in the future. All right, now I wanna hear your bird stories. Hmm? Hey, Colleen. Yep. Also, don't some of those apps keep the your life list for you? Because I mean, like iNaturalist will keep track of all the observations you make if you would actually take photos of all the birds and enter them in. But doesn't like eBird and Merlin, do those keep lists for you? Um, so eBird will keep keep a list of all, like anytime you enter a bird, you know, it'll keep that list. I don't know about Merlin. I mean, maybe somebody can um, answer that. All right. Uh, I think Merlin might, but I haven't played around with it very much. Colleen, Merlin will, and they also have packs that you can use, um, say, if you're going to go out to Arizona. You can get the pack for that state, and then it will also show you where there are good birding spots. They call, oh, okay. They call, they call them hot spots. Okay. And um, so that will have like a whole map and you can say, well, I'm going to go down to Texas and I'm going to go down to, to Galveston. Where's a good uh, hot spot um, on Galveston Bay and what birds are being seen? And you can look at that. Huh. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how to, there we go. I didn't catch that. Is, is that the name of the app, Hotspots? No, it's Merlin. And in their app, they have um, Hotspots. Thank you, Martha. Thank I'm you. Gonna... Okay, so does anyone have questions, any bird stories they want to share? Yes. I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, yesterday on our bird feeder, there was a bird and I don't know what it was, a grackling or a crow or something, but it's tail, it was all black, but the tail was white. Is this, it wasn't snow. <laughs> How big was it? Larger than a robin. I don't know. Did you notice you, anything else? Do you else? remember the shape of the tail or the beak or anything? No, I do not. But what, could it be a birthmark or a partial al albinoism thing? Or um, That would be leucism. Leucistic, Leuc Leuc yeah. Leuc yeah. Leucistic. I don't know. What do you think, Nancy? We had a crow in our yard for several years that had a big white feather. And we could always ID the same bird. And it, for some, you know, reason, it just had a white feather. And I've seen it in other birds too. Leucistic or leucistic or whatever the word is. Yeah, it's just a genetic aberration. So I would so, say, go ahead. I was gonna say, I would say next time you see it, do your head to toe. Let's see if there's yeah. anything else on that bird besides that white tail that would help you identify it. And that leucistic term, that's a brand new word to me. Yeah, that's when it's, so albino is when it has complete loss of pigmentation, but leucistic oh, okay. is, it has some color to it. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Leslie asked me to talk about the Great Backyard Bird Count. Um, that's free, that doesn't cost anything to participate. That was a citizen science project 
that has started by Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And that was basically where you just went out, um, it was uh, Friday through Monday and you just, you know, you go to the park, you record all the birds you see, the birds in your backyard, and you report that to eBird. And that, that, that helps scientists get a sense of uh, bird populations because a lot of birds will breed up in the Arctic and no one, you know, there, there may be not a lot of information known about that bird that breeds up in the Arctic, but if it comes here during the winter, you know, we can get a better sense of the population of that bird or any kind of unusual habits. Uh, somebody asked, uh, let's see, we've seen a male cardinal a few times. So blue jays and cardinals um, are known to like completely lose their top head feathers while molting. So it just kind of depends on the time of year that you see that. Um, usually it's in the fall where they just lose, the, but they're fine. They just lose all their feathers. Uh, Carolyn? Yeah, uh, Tom and I um, had a memorable sighting of a American kestrel at Route 66 State Park a few weeks ago, uh, maybe a month ago. It was uh, the first time we ever saw the hovering behavior. And we saw it over the field hover about four times. And uh, I, the other time I had a memorable encounter with one of those was in a historic park in New Mexico it was at Fort Union. It was an old army fort from the 1800s. And there was a fledgling that couldn't quite fly yet. And I found it in one of the ruins of the fort as I was hiking the trail there. And it uh, faced me and hissed and was really PO'd at me. So it was given a fierce performance, but it could not fly yet. So I, I just caught it in that few days when it was vulnerable. And I was impressed with that little guy and how fierce it was. And uh, it, it gave me a glare and it gave me a threat display <laughs> and everything. And <laughs> it was so cute. <laughs> so those are, those are my best. Best what sightings of those. What about the oh, the grouse at Yellowstone. Yeah, the first time I ever saw a grouse was at Yellowstone in the summer of 2019. And I, I'd seen one on a video in Russia, but I'd never seen one, a North American one in, in person at all. Oh, and this we, we were on this uh, four wheel drive road in Yellowstone right at dusk. And not this grouse. But was angry and it, it was crossing the road when we approached it and it, it sat on a log next to the trail and gave us a threat display and I got some video of it and I didn't know they were as big as they are but uh, this was the only bird we saw pretty much on that whole trail mm -hmm. and this bird was like telling us to get out <laughs> <laughs> It was not backing down. It was oh standing its ground. Oh my God, no. It, stand, it, it stood its ground. And maybe if it was five inches tall, it grew to 20 inches tall. That's how <laughs> yeah, it gave this a big thing, oh my display. God. Yeah. It, it, the hind feathers, everything just rose up and said, yeah. get out. Yeah. Now. Yeah, that was funny. That was <laughs> funny. That was cool. That was neat. That was neat to see all the plumage of the flowers. Flowers of the. Flowers. Yeah, I had its tail all up and erect, and its wings out, and the beak open. <laughs> that was cool. All right, Nancy says, um, "Good birding places: Forest Park, Tower Grove Park, um, oh, Carondelet. Carondelet, yeah." What else? What do you think? Riverlands. Riverlands. Yeah. And Emanator. Bush, bush wildlife. Yeah. Uh, what about Forest 44? Yeah. Emanator is a good spot too that you wouldn't usually think. Oh yeah. Yeah. Especially during mm -hmm. migration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Mary would like to tell her story about bows for birds. I have two yes, I, have another, I have a question too about a bird identity. Oh sure. Um, 
So which one should I do first? Whatever, whatever you want. You got the okay. floor. I'm going nuts about this bird. Um, you know, and I was trying to identify it myself, but it's kind of big. It's like a, um, like a blue jay. And I don't know if it's as big as I think it is just because it's all puffed up because of the cold, but it's yeah. head and its neck was a pale gray. Um, and he had a big white bushy chest and he had a tail that was black and, you know, long and shoots down. And I don't know if it was notched or not. I hadn't figured that out. So it, have you thought about mockingbird possibly? No, my husband says no. <laughs> what does he know? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Typical comment about husbands. <laughs> let me think okay. about let me think about it and get back to you okay so my other story is about the bows for birds i had no idea about bows for birds nothing my husband and i the the only the thing that we enjoy the most doing together is going for walks you know on the weekends or during the week whatever so we're in shaw nature reserve and you know it's cold and kind of dreary and there's you know they only let in so many people so we didn't see a lot people but all of a sudden my husband goes oh my god look at that woodpecker and I'm like oh my god you know so we start walking up to it and then of course we see that it's a wooden bird and I'm like <laughs> that is not funny I said why how could they tease us like that right I'm still you know I have no idea why they had us a, a wooden uh red how do you say it woodpecker red it was a pileated one it was a pileated it was one a out pileated. of Shaw. Okay. Yeah. So we were like, how bizarre. And my husband's the one that spotted it, right, honey? So then we um, give him a little credit. Um, we're walking away, you know, to continue our walk. And then I see the big gold bow. <laughs> I haven't done it yet. He knows about it. That's how you find these. It's called, it's a bow. And then there's a... Um, you know, a piece of paper on the tree that tells you what to do. So I was like, that is the coolest like, thing. I want to write yeah. a note about that. I think so the competition I, uh, part of it's I, over there. My husband and I actually went to Creek Court Park because we just started to get, I started getting crazy about it. And it was like the worst weather. And, you know, we, we got there and it was just torrential downpour. So we didn't do that one, but I I did find two other birds and I just thought it was the coolest thing, but I didn't know anything about it, but I loved it that it was, I was just out there and it happened and we saw it and, you know, it was cool. So, cool. Um, let's see, someone said something about mute swans. That's cool that you have mute swans at your lake. And Adam, okay, so I have a funny story about Canada geese. When I worked at the butterfly house, I used to work at the butterfly house. And then, you know, during the summer, you get your bully Canada geese and they were at the door. Well, one day I was leaving, leaving work and I had one approach me and he started to hiss and I looked at it and I said, listen, I don't want to hear any of your crap. And I stared at it and it walked away. I mean, it, <laughs> so honestly, I think it's your tone of voice. You know, just stand strong and say, hey, back off. I mean, just stay in your ground. I know it's kind of uh, against your instinct to run, but um, let's see, what else? Okay, so you're seeing the yellow-bellied sapsucker right now with its chest puffed up? Let's go ahead and pull this. Okay, so if you, if you, okay, it's, it's trying to keep warm. Um, right now, a lot of the birds are doing that where they're just so puffy that you, um, they look like they're sick, but they're not. They're just trying to stay warm. You have a couple questions farther back uh, that were, came out while you were doing your presentation about like identification. I think like back, back to one about woodpeckers. Uh, oh. Uh. All right. Uh, okay. Do all woodpeckers have a red feather spot on their head? 
all males do. Females have some, depending on the species, some, um, some don't and some do. It's just, you gotta look at the book and just determine. I don't know what it's for though. Uh, which birds in our area have declining populations? Hmm. Pigeons. Pigeons? Yep. I tend not to think about the non-natives. I don't care. I like pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tend to think of migrants, uh, summer birds. I can't think of one that hasn't, it isn't declining, to be honest with you. Um, I recently learned, this is just a bird that migrates through, but the Wilson's warbler apparently is really dropping their populations are, and it just breaks my heart because they're just so cute with their little black hat. I mean, oh, I don't know. What do you, Nancy, would you have any ideas? Just for all the warblers in general. We had a yeah. friend who had been birding for like 50, 60 years, and he said when he was a young man, he, he could just himself see the drop. I mean, 50% drop, if not more. It was really yeah, yeah. just the warblers in general. Yeah. Um, Habitat loss. And I don't know how many people got to see the research that came out because it was right before the pandemic hit, but at the very end of 2019, uh, Cornell released uh, a really big research uh, paper showing all the bird declines kind of across the board. So if, if you've not uh, seen that, you really should uh, take a look at that. Deal. There is some like good to the study as well that shows that like some of the predator birds populations have gone up because of conservation efforts and waterfowl. Uh, some waterfowl populations have gone up because of conservation work, uh, but across the board, like songbirds uh, and grassland birds and uh, many other uh, species of birds have just been declining all across North America. Yeah. Okay, juvenile bird is a young bird that has left the nest. Uh, juvenile bird um, is past fledging, I should say. So it's a young bird. It's a bird that's less than a year old. Um, but also um, all birds are considered adult birds after January 1st. I don't, <laughs> I don't know why, but that's, yeah. Uh, any other questions? Did you see the question Please. about? When did, did you, you see turn the question into a hawk? about? The, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead and finish yours first. Oh no, I was just asking when he turned into a hawk. Did you see the question about the uh, extreme cold that we're having now and the effect on? What What is the effect on uh, on birds now of this extreme cold snap that's going to last a week or so? Um. I will say fruit eating birds are probably going to be in big trouble. Uh, American robins, eastern bluebirds, because they don't eat seed. Um, yeah, the, this is the, the time of year when, the, when the, the fruit is frozen and they can't really access the fruit. The, I mean, there are probably going to be a lot of bird deaths. Um, that's why I say if you don't feed birds, just feed it now. I mean, just even just for this week. Um, throw out some black oil sunflower seed just to help them get through this. So you, know, you mentioned black oil sunflower seeds in your last presentation. My concern about that is I've got these little tiny birds that are at my bird feeder. Can they, can they break open the, the uh, even the small little wrens and the mm -hmm. chickadee? So I'm using generic bird seed, uh, which has just a few of the black oil um, sunflower seeds in it. If I switch to the complete black oil sunflower seed, is that more healthy for them, for all of them? They have my backyard feeder? Um, so like the generic seed you're talking about, that's yeah, like a just, lot of just, little... uh, just economy bird seed, you know, with yeah. all mixture of different seeds in it. That actually has a lot of fillers and the birds aren't going to eat a lot of that seed, like the little or the little red things and the little cracked corn. I don't, I mean, some birds do eat cracked corn, but yeah, you're gonna, 
it's going to be better for them if you if you get the black oil sunflower seed and they can't eat it it's a weak it has a weak shell colleen, do you have any colleen do you have any recommendations for bird behavior resources and books funny you mentioned that because that is going to be i'm going to send out a um a resource guide and I'm, i have a couple books on Perfect. that Perfect. yeah thank you well winter birds eat fresh fruit I think so. Um, like oranges, I'm trying to think of other things. Grapes, if you like cut them in half. Yes. Just make sure it's cut where they can access it. And also grape jelly and yes. they, uh, they also recommend uh, taking apples and slicing apples because the birds will eat those. Yeah. Yeah, even the yeah jelly that like you said, as long as it's cut open. Oh, wait a minute. How, how about putting um, uh, peanut butter on pine cones like you used to do as a kid and stuff? Yes. Bird seed. Okay. Yes. Good. Hey, I have to just say that James, I see your hawk and I raise you an owl. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and this one's pretty damn big too. <laughs> He's 108 years old. Wow. Well, yeah. I, I'm going to raise you a raven. Look, there at me. you go. I got my bird. <laughs> this is my favorite t shirt. And I did not plan this, people. Okay. I wore this for my pajamas last night. Well, okay. I wore this on purpose and you can't even see it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cute. I like that. Okay, now one thing, Colleen, about the, the peanut butter is I understand to be very careful to get natural peanut butter, or is there something that we should be doing? You can go to Wild Birds Unlimited and get bark butter. Yeah. Bark butter, okay. <laughs> you can spread it, and you know, and you can spread it on a tree. Say oh. that again. Say that again. What is bark, bark butter, butter from Wild Birds Unlimited? <clears throat> and really, you can just, like I said, take peanut butter, spread it on a tree trunk. I mean, if you don't have a, a feeder or anything. Oh, wait a second. Who had, oh, somebody had a loon? Something. Let me see your, <laughs> no. it's, 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 a, it's made from a golf club. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, I gotta go get my. Get my oh. <laughs> I do have a loon somewhere. It's, it's awesome. like show and tell time now. Yes. <laughs> James started it. Okay. Crisco suet. As long as you put other things in the Crisco, don't feed it all of it. Just like put in um, bird seed, peanut butter. I mean, I think that's okay. I'm not overly familiar with what's bad for birds in terms of fat. I heard that Crisco was not recommended. Peanut okay. Butter. Okay. How about um, uh, unsugared cereal, like fresh granolas and cereals and stuff? Can you put that in? Um, what do you think, Nancy? I don't. Mm, I don't know. I Mar Cornell says no. Okay. Okay. Um, they did a. There's a YouTube video on feeding birds. And they do not recommend doing like oatmeal or anything like that because that, you know, if the bird drinks water, the oatmeal swells up and it's, mm -hmm. and, and it's not really oh. good. Yeah. What about oh, cornmeal? So cornmeal? you guys want to see a bird? Oh, oh, there's oh, a bird. Yeah. Oh, Mark, Mary, that's so Mary, oh, Mary, Mary Wente knows which one this is. I want that. You're not going to get it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Martha, you are as wonderful as ever. I miss that. <laughs> uh, Jay, you have a question? Yeah, you, somebody just mentioned water. You know, I was thinking we, we have a little um, runoff uh, uh, creek behind our, behind our uh, home, but everything's frozen now. Where are the birds getting? What can we do about water? How are they getting water now? Snow. So, um, getting a can... bird bath which I have. Or bird yeah, get is. a heated bird bath. There's immersion um, heaters if you dash. Yes. yes, I have one you can, you clip up right on your deck railing and it's just the bowl 
and it's electric and it keeps the water, you know, from freezing. Yeah, it's places, great. hardware stores will have immersion heaters or I'm not sure they have uh, heated bird baths, but like places like Wild Birds Unlimited will have that. Is, bird, that real, no? is that a real serious issue now for, during everything it can, frozen? It can be. I mean, they need a water source. I mean, even if you put water out for an hour, I mean, I know sometimes that, you know, you got to worry about freezing, but, or, you know, if you have a runoff, you said yeah. break, break a hole in the ice. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have a comment. Yes. Especially to those who work uh, as staff people at LRC. I have so enjoyed, and it's Adam and Mary, Leslie, James. The videos are wonderful. Yeah. I mean, I look yeah. forward to that every every week, and you all have been so Adam, especially you, you should be an actor. Yes. Um, <laughs> but they really are, they kind of bring the center in and you all have done an absolutely fantastic job of keeping us included. And I just want to thank you all and tell you what a great job you're doing. Yes. I want to second uh, that. Yes. yes. I agree. Thank you. Uh, I apologize for last week's video not being able to come out on time. It's going to have to be this week because I've just been here since Sunday working with the uh, frozen pipes situation. So, mm -hmm. where are the roads today? So-so. Uh, mm -hmm. Really depends on the situation. 270 wasn't awful. There was a couple lanes on 270 that are pretty clear. Uh, and, it, and it's not like there's ice everywhere. It's mainly just, you know, snow because it's so freezing cold. It's never melted. But today with it being sunny, I'm sure there's probably going to be ice tonight. So be careful tonight. Well, everyone, this was wonderful. Thank you. I'm so glad you showed up. I hope. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you. Thank you. And I will provide... I will provide um, a list of uh, resources in my email, and I'm always in for hearing bird stories, bird questions. I'm a little obsessed with them, so I love to share my knowledge and hear good stories. <laughs>